I'd like to talk about special inks that are used for security printing. One of the reasons that you'd use special inks is if you need something else to do on the package already. This is a good example of what we call pre-conductive inks. If you look carefully, it looks a little bit like gold. It's going to be very difficult to show on camera because of the, the reflectivity of the material. If I've got a package that I want to use as, for example, an antenna, I can turn this into a conductive antenna if I use a conductive ink. If I want to click together two small microchips that are on the package, I might want a conductive ink that's there. This is actually one of my patents, is using one of these as the antenna for the RFID. So this would enable a large retailer like a Tesco or a Sainsbury to buy just a single RFID at bulk rate. Get hundreds of millions of these, sometimes billions of these, and they don't have one RFID that can be read from 30 feet away, one RFID that can be read from 10 feet away. Those, that segments what they're purchasing and they pay more per RFID chip. Now they buy one RFID chip and the ones they only want read from like a near field type of an approach, they don't put any conductive ink on the packaging. The ones they do, they put a conductive ink on the packaging and use it as an antenna and that makes it be readable from 30 meters away instead of 30 centimeters. So they actually gauge the readability of the RFID in terms of distance by the ink they put over it, not by the RFID chip. This ties into the continuum of doing what we call pre-compensation. So for colors, for example, we will print out a series of colors and then see what happens after we capture them on the device that's going to be used to read those colors later. What happens often is you'll get color travel. You'll actually have a color that may have been a very strong red shift a little bit towards orange. And so what we will do is we'll print that red out initially with a little bit of extra magenta so that when it actually goes through that color travel, it shifts directly to red. Color travel is also used in other forms of security printing like on bills. You'll see on US bills something that looks green and when you shift it, it shifts all the way to magenta. That's called a 180 degree color shift because it shifts 180 degrees in color space. So from a computer science standpoint, why these specialty inks are so important to us, we'll often have inks that have particular types of chroma, color information, or other information that's in there. That is a very powerful uh, computational aspect to it. I mentioned color travel. Let's say, for example, I've got these two oranges. You can see here, this orange, the original printed one, when it's been copied, is actually a little bit more yellow. In color space, let's say the orange is right here, yellow is over here. I've traveled about five degrees in color space. What I can do is, if this is important to me to read this as orange, I will add a slight bit of red to this, and now when I get the color travel, it locks right in place at that orange instead of over in the yellow. This is called spectral precompensation. So what you have is you have a large set of colors that you print out, you um, basically image, and then using your computer algorithm, you, you determine which of those colors, when it actually travels, ends up in the color you want it to be in. So very powerful parallel com computing that goes on to be able to do, to do that on the fly for all of the labels that come in there. So the, that color travel, is that travel as in uh, a difference between what you think you're going to get and what you actually get? Or is it something that happens over time or is it happens over the print? Uh... Great set of questions. There's, there's actually three different types of pre-compensation that you want to do and you alluded to two and a half of those. So the first one is the actual color travel where I have, because of the way I image this, it Im immediately has a different color than what I wanted because I can't image that because of the differences in, you know, in, in, in the CMOS imagers that we're using for most of our cameras now. Those will not read the colors exactly as they were printed. The second one you alluded to, which was kind of cool, is does it change over time? Absolutely. And there will be ones that you particularly know are going to fade over time. So if you want those to be legitimate, you can have that, you can add some other color to them so that they'll fade properly and stay as a color, or you can use that as an indicator that something is being reused, right? So you can intentionally have something that will change over time so that if the product or if that code that's associated with the product should only last 18 months, in 18 months' time, the image is faded enough that it'll show as non-legitimate. Really good question. The third form, which is probably not as interesting but does take a lot of computer science, is what we call structural precompensation. So if we look at this packaging here, this is a very small barcode here. This is actually a data matrix barcode that's inside of these color tiles. That data matrix barcode is often hard to read with a mobile camera. Most people have a mobile camera in their pocket, and so we want them to be able to read those. We will actually do something called structural precompensation to make that read best. 
What happens when you read with one of these cameras is you'll get a bit of blurring. And so if you've got a black pixel, I'm going to use a big example here. If I've got a black module there, which is one of the little black pieces in that barcode, it will show up like this after the blur. So it'll jump like this. So what we do instead, if we want it to be that large in the end, we actually print a little bit of white along the side to make it that small so the camera reads the black part as exactly the right size and we get the right contrast between white and black. I've done testing on this. If you don't do the structural precompensation, it can be copied three times over until the read quality is as poor on the third copy of a copy for the counterfeiter as the original structurally precomped. And so these have all been structurally precomped so that they are small enough that it makes it difficult for somebody to copy. You're basically anticipating the blur that the camera will put in. Exactly. Sort of reversing that a little bit so that that blur will be correct. And exactly. then obviously a copy of that won't have the same properties. Is that right? Right. E exactly right. So if you have the original one there, the first time you image it, it'll show up as legitimate. If somebody now makes a copy of that, they'll have lost that structural precompensation and that will blur larger and they won't get as good of a read off of it. And so if you're checking read quality, if you're looking at read success rate, any other type of thing like that, that's going to show up right away in the supply chain and people are going to be complaining that they can't read the barcode or something. Or you'll even see the anomaly just in the number of successful barcode reads when you're monitoring these on the back end service. Even if it goes from like 4% success rate to 3%, in other words, 4% of people actually read their barcodes here, 3% here, that might be a significant enough statistical difference for me to know that something's gone wrong with the barcode. So we always look for anomalies in our data. This is sort of the, from the computing side, a lot of the work that we're doing on the back end with the data. This is truly big data. I mean, HP will have hundreds of millions of these cartridges sold every year. We're looking for deltas of, you know, 0.1% as being significant in terms of possible possibly sniffing out illicit activity in the supply chain. Just putting these in place, all of this taking a lot of computer, you know, computer design for this, you put structural, spectral, and temporal precompensation in place, it allows you to have a label that's optimized for the security program that you're trying to put in place. You'll wonder what's different in each of these. I've got a different hidden mark, which is called a covert mark or a digital watermark, hidden behind these sort of uh, solid tones in each of these places.